Okay. We are going to give folks one more minute to log in and then we'll get started. All right, good afternoon. This is Jason Jones with the Community Technical Assistance Center, and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, Racial Trauma Within Asian American and Pacific Islander Communities. Before we get started, I wanna take a moment to orient everyone to the Zoom system, my apologies, to the WebEx system, so you know how to participate in today's event. Please note that upon joining the conversation, you've been placed on mute to avoid any background noises that may distract others from listening to the presentation. If you come across any technical issues during today's event, please chat to the host who will be able to assist you. You will have the opportunity to submit questions for the Q&A portion of today's presentation by utilizing the chat box feature, which is located on the bottom of your screen. In order to ensure that we're able to answer as many questions as time permits, we are requesting that you send in your questions at any point during the conversation, and we will address them during the Q&A. And with that, we are very excited to have with us today, Dr. Doris Chang, clinical psychologist and associate professor at the NYU Silver School of Social Work. Thank you for joining us. And now I'll give it away to Dr. Chang to get us started. Thank you, Jason. Welcome everybody. Thank you for being here on a muggy Thursday. Um, as Jason said, I'm a clinical psychologist by training and I'm also a researcher and a faculty member at NYU Silver School of Social Work. And I'm um, relating to this topic today of racial trauma within Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. I have a couple of different kind of touch points. And one is as a practicing clinician, I know many of you on this call are also practicing clinicians. Um, I work uh, in a private practice setting, um, have for many years. And prior to that worked with um, Asian Americans in a community mental health uh, uh, organization. Um, in Boston and also in Los Angeles. Um, and then the other piece of context is um, that I myself am Asian American. And so the events of the past year have affected me personally and also professionally. Um, personally, because, you know, I, I have parents who are um, elderly, um, they're, they live far away from where I am. Um, I also have school aged children. And so all these events of the past year in terms of the rise in anti-Asian violence and discrimination have really kind of hit us close to home. Um, I'll share a little bit about that. And then also that um, I'm you know, teaching actively about issues of race and ethnicity and culture and how we try to negotiate and bridge differences in the therapeutic relationship. And then finally, as a practicing clinician, um, these issues have really come alive with a lot of my Asian clients. And so I'll, you know, hopefully um, have some time to, to engage with you around some of those cases. But bef before we get into it, um, I wanted to to kind of just start by telling you about a case that actually um, I'm, I'm currently seeing. And uh, this is uh, an Asian American um, who came in to see me reporting a lot of experiences of, of um, significant anxiety, um, panic attacks, um, that really had uh, had really begun last summer, and this is somebody I actually had worked with for you know ten years ago um, around issues of sort of family origin issues. Um, resolved many things, uh, took a long break, and then ten years later contacted me again. And one of the precipitating concerns was this increase in anti Asian violence as it was intersecting with a lot of other stressors of the pandemic. Um, and so this has really become kind of alive in our work. So as a by way of context, I wanted to start us off by um, making sure that we're, um, you know, we have a roadmap for our, our time together. The first is um, providing a bit of background in terms of who are Asian Americans. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about what the data show about the increases in discrimination and hate um, as far as number of survey studies and um, reporting center data. Also to provide a history and context to understand what does it mean that we're seeing this increase at this moment in time? How does it connect to previous moments in our history um, in Asian, sort of Asian American history? Um, and how that connects to common stereotypes of APIs. 
Then I'm going to talk a little bit about racism related stress, trauma and its effects, um, how it relates to mental health, how different coping strategies um, lead to different um, kinds of outcomes, and then um, some things we can be doing to support our Asian American clients and ways we can actually support ourselves if we identify as Asian American. And then we're going to have some time for Q&A. Okay, so who are Asian Americans? So Asian Americans are an incredibly diverse group of people. Um, currently, we number 7% of the total US population, and that includes um, multiracial Asian Americans, which account for 14% of Asian Americans. We are the fastest growing ethnic group, um, and we are predominantly foreign born. So 71% of Asian American adults were born in another country. And we can see here um, the six largest origin groups. Um, we have Chinese, uh, Indian, Filipino, Vietnamese, Korean, and Japanese, and those groups number 85% of all Asian Americans. So we, you can see how our roots are spread um, across East and Southeast Asia and the Indian subcontinent. Um, and, and, you know, we also uh, are incredibly diverse in terms of the, the, the number of countries. There's, there's, you know, something like um, 20 countries um, that are you know, well represented um, in terms of Asian immigrant communities. Socioeconomically, Asian Americans are a really interesting group. We have a sort of a bi bimodal distribution in terms of education and class. Now, even though Asian Americans as a whole have a higher median household income compared to all other ethnic groups, we are, and we also have higher le levels of education, this varies tremendously across and within Groups. So within Asian American groups, we have those who are, you know, very, very high earning, very, very high achieving, but we also have groups who are, who are living um, in poverty, who are dropping out of school, um, who are exhibiting a lot of risk factors for mental health problems. Um, so we, I want us to keep in mind that oftentimes we forget um, that Asian Americans um, are such a diverse group of people when we think about who's sort of available to us, when we think about Asian Americans, who are we thinking about in the media, who are we thinking about in our places of work. Um, finally, we are very, very diverse in terms of language, um, religion, immigration histories. Um, so, you know, it's important for us to make space in our kind of ideas about who are Asian Americans um, and allow that to hold all of this diversity that is contained within that label. So many of us are here because we're concerned about the scope of the violence facing Asian Americans today. And this first image is was taken a vigil after the Atlanta shootings, March 16th, um, in which uh, in which six Asian American were Asian Americans, um, Asian American women were among um, eight who were murdered um, at three different um, spas outside of Atlanta. Um, in this middle section, we had, you know, just a month later, four Sikh Americans were among those who were killed in a mass shooting at a FedEx facility in Indianapolis. And then finally, we have a lot of um, street level violence that's occurring all, all over the country, not just in New York City, not just in these larger um, urban spaces, um, but we're seeing reports of street level violence and assaults. That are this is an image captured by um, someone's cell phone, and those images are proliferating and being spread and shared through social media. So it's capturing our attention as a public. The media are starting to report it more and more. Um, but you know, many of you might be wondering, you know, is this just sort of typical levels of violence with the media is just starting to pay attention? You know, what is actually the scope of violence we're facing? So the API Reporting Center. Um, was organized in March of 2020, and the, the reason is that the organizers um, realized that as the, the rhetoric around the coronavirus was shifting to blame, um, to blaming China and Chinese Americans, um, that they anticipated that there would be an uptick in hate crimes. And so they quickly organized a reporting center and put up incident reporting forms in um, you know, a dozen Asian languages to make it available to folks and encourage people to report what their experiences were. And this is because many Asian Americans are wary about approaching the police. Um, there are language barriers to um, engaging with the police as well, um, but they thought it was really important for us to be 
cataloging the scope of these incidents. And so um, in the most recent uh, summary of the data, um, this captures uh, the 12 months between March of 2020 and March of 2021. Um, the latest incident report uh, summary shows that there were 6,603 incidents reported during this period to that API uh, hate reporting center. 65% um, of those were acts of verbal harassment, um, but we see you know, about 18% people reporting that they were being shunned or avoided, um, about 12 and a half percent reported acts of physical assault and violence. Um, civil rights violations includes um, not being allowed to enter a, a, a store or a restaurant or public transportation, and also it includes workplace discrimination. And then um, also seven and a half percent reported incidents of online harassment. So we're seeing kind of a range of how this is um, playing out, but according to this reporting center, the bulk of these acts were um, verbal harassment. So you might be wondering where are these reports coming in from. You know, um, Stop API Hate was organized and founded in California in collaboration with a number of California agencies. Um, so it's not surprising that um, you know they've been able to get the word out a bit more. Forty percent of those. Um, incident reports came in from California, 15% from New York City. You can see the, the others, but it actually represents something like 43 states. So it's not just occurring in on the coasts or in in um, in, um, in larger urban environments. It's actually being reported um, all over the country in most of most states in the US. Um, in terms of who's reporting, um, we, we are seeing sort of paralleling the population representation. Most, you know, 44% um, of those uh, filing reports are Chinese, um, Korean, um, Filipinx, um, Vietnamese, Japanese, Taiwanese. But you can also see incredible diversity um, among those who are reporting. Okay, so we can start to, to now we're seeing this picture of like this is you know, pretty pervasive. It's occurring across the country. It's affecting diverse um, Asian Americans. Um, and here are some examples. So this is first examples from Northridge, California. The, the person's mother was ordering food at a restaurant when a man tried to hit her in the face. She was able to avoid him, but he yelled a bunch of slurs, including go back to China and Corona before he ran out. So imagine you're you're at a restaurant, you're with your parents, and somebody tries to hit your mother in the face. So these are really confrontational, aggressive acts. This next incident in Boston, again affecting elderly mother, was waiting for the subway. Try, someone tried to push her off the platform down onto the train tracks. Fortunately, she screamed. Someone intervened, and she was she was able to stay safe. This next example from the Woodlands in Texas um, describes their children being shunned um, at school. Kids were saying the, um, that this person's kids had the coronavirus um, and that everybody should stay away from them. And then observing that parents would kind of pull their kids away from this family if they got too close. And then in Gilbert, Arizona, this last example, this person was uh, shopping at a grocery store um, pushed their cart past a gentleman who's who said, you know, a racial slur, um, and then kind of repeatedly encountered this person um, who would continue to say that same thing. All right, and then again connecting this person to the the virus. So we are seeing that these that these acts are not just kind of sort of typical racial discrimination. It is um, specifically linked to fears. Um, of Asian Americans as connected to the virus. So I want to ask you, um, you know, given that we've observed there's been an increase in media coverage, many of us are sort of just becoming aware um, or have just become aware of like thinking about Asian Americans as potentially a target of racism. Um, I wanted to ask, and we'll do a little poll, how common do you think these incidents are? Like if you think about Asian Americans, you know, um, your clients, um, people in your own community, on average, how common do you think these incidents are across the population? All right, so let's let's you know give give you a couple seconds to give your best guess, and we'll see how close we are. Uh, 
right, I'll close the poll in about five seconds. Please submit your answer. Okay, what are the results? What does this group think? Yeah, they'll pop up in about three seconds. Okay, so it looks like a lot of folks did not guess. <laughs> Nobody likes to likes to be wrong. Um, so Let's see, we have 25% thinking less than 10%, 13%, between 20 and 30%. 28% um, of you think it's C, 40 to 50%, and 11% at 60 to 70%. Okay, so the answer is, oops, is 40 to 50%. So th these are our best estimates based on a number of different surveys. Um, conducted by a number of different research teams, um, indicating that about 40 to 50 percent of Asian Americans across the country are reporting direct experiences of anti-Asian discrimination and harassment since the start of the pandemic. So I'm going to tell you about one of these surveys. This was conducted by my colleague and I. It's the NYU CARA study. Um, in December of 2020, we collected um, surveys from 689 Asian Americans across the country, and we asked them um, the degree to which and how often they experienced um, any one of, of a list of acts of discrimination and violence. And so we found, um, and we were focusing specifically on direct um, encounters, um, we did not include online experiences, um, and we found over 40% of respondents reported at least one of these main acts of um, discrimination or harassment since the start of the pandemic. Um, so we actually saw pretty comparable rates of being avoided or shunned, about 30, 35% and also verbal harassment. Um, one in four reported workplace discrimination, 16% reported being coughed or spat on, um, which I just can't even believe. 16% um, of people had others cough or spit on them. 14% um, experienced being um, barred from an establishment. 13% um, experienced some sort of defacement of property or vandalism. Um, and again, we're seeing this number of 12% reporting physical assault and another 12% being barred from transportation. So, you know, in our sample, it's, you know, four out of 10 Asian Americans reported this. This is pretty consistent from a, a number of different polls. Um, those polls that are actually reporting higher um, estimates, around 50%, um, are those that um, were able to translate their measures into Asian languages. So I would assume that this is an underestimate because we were not able to include um, people who speak English as, a, as um, who are not, um, English language proficient. Um, so that's why we're giving this sort of best guesstimate of 40 to 50% of Asian Americans experiencing at least one of these acts since the start of the pandemic. Okay. And I really want you to like take that in thinking about your clients, thinking about people that you know that this is happening to, you know, about half of us. Okay. So how did we get here? I think this is kind of helpful just as framing, thinking about our clients, sometimes our clients, you know, ask these kinds of questions. It's helpful, I think, from a, from a sense of <clears throat> having a narrative that is grounded in reality um, to, to maybe have a working understanding of, 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 you know, why is it that we think we're, we're um, experiencing this right now? So as a caveat, in 2015, the World Health Organization wrote, disease names really do matter. We have seen certain disease names provoke a backlash against members of particular religious and ethnic communities. 
Um, terms that should be avoided in naming diseases include geographic locations. Okay, so back in 2015, there was already a warning. There was already guidelines laid out for how we should be referring to new infectious diseases, um, because there's been a history of um, stigmatizing groups if uh, infectious new infectious disease, disease is um, connected to that group in terms of how it is named. So, oops, how come I can't? Okay. So in um, March 16, um, 2020, um, then President Donald Trump first tweeted the phrase Chinese virus. Okay. It was the first time this phrase had been used. Um, and a week later, based on some um, Twitter analyses, we saw this proliferation of the term, the hashtag Chinese virus on Twitter. Um, the number of people using that hashtag increased more than tenfold, and they were much more likely to pair that hashtag use with an anti-Asian hashtag compared to those who just tweeted um, the more descriptive hashtag COVID-19. Okay, so we're starting to see, in terms of how that political rhetoric is starting to seep into the public consciousness and shape racial sentiment. Um, so we're starting to see increased you know, uptake of that terminology, not just by, by Donald Trump, but also by a number of different politicians. And then we saw around that same time, um, survey polls finding that about a quarter of Americans believing that the, that the Chinese are to blame. And a more recent poll actually confirmed that that number is holding steady, about a quarter of Americans blame the Chinese for the virus. Okay, and um, there are some studies that are looking at like, you know, who is it that's blaming the Chinese? Um, some of those predictors include pre-existing racial prejudice, um, a feeling of, um, of that they're not equipped um, to cope with the pandemic, um, and then also partisan media viewing. You know, are they watching more conservative um, news programs, et cetera? Okay, so we, you know, there's, there's quite a, a lot of emerging evidence that words matter that there's sort of public shaping of um, narratives around the virus, and that has had an effect on the public. But this is not the first time that Asian Americans have been blamed for a, uh, an external threat. So this we can trace this back to the 1800s, the late 1800s. Um, there was a shortage of labor. There were you know big industrialists were trying to build the transcontinental railroad. Um, they weren't able to get enough white laborers who would do this backbreaking work for low wages. So they actively recruited Chinese laborers, Chinese men in large numbers, 20,000 Chinese laborers were recruited and brought into to the country. Some, some of them came on their own. They had already been here because of the gold rush, but they, they signed on to do this work. And after the, the transcontinental railroad was completed, there was this um, sort of effort by um, politicians, by journalists, by these industrialists to paint a picture of these Chinese as um, kind of a threat to the livelihoods of the, the white men um, who were starting to feel like, you know, these guys were, were now available to do jobs. They were willing to work for cheap and they began to be kind of painted as a, a real economic threat. So during this time we saw at, again, very high rates of violence um, against Chinese. Um, we the largest mass mass lynching occurred in this nation's um, history of 18 Chinese who were lynched in Los Angeles around this time. So there was a lot of violence that erupted again um, with this idea that this is a, a foreign scourge on our country. Um, and. This kind of was capitalizing on an idea that was already percolating at the time that was already being picked up by the media and also, you know, widespread in Europe and in Russia as well, where there was this idea of the Chinese as this kind of nameless horde, this they called it this sort of yellow horde or this yellow terror that were threatening to kind of take over and threaten sort of Western supremacy. Um, they were painted as this kind of immoral, dirty, um, uneducated group of people, sort of uncivilized. And here's an, a political image, a political cartoon from that time in 1899, um, where the description was the yellow terror in all of his glory. And you see this, this Chinese man sporting the, the, the Qin Dynasty Q, um, brandishing all of these weapons, standing over this fallen white woman who represents the West. So this idea of the yellow peril 
um, was proliferating during that time, and we and it pops up at various times in our history. This idea that we are a threat, that we are foreign, that we are um, that we are not civilized, um, that we are disease carrying. Um, and it connects to the idea of, of um, Americans as, as Asian Americans as being unsimilatable, and that we are perpetually foreign, that our loyalties to the U.S. will always be in question. And that led to, in the 1800s, um, a number of pieces of legislation that barred Chinese from entering um, the country. We were welcomed in when they needed us. We were pushed out when we were seen as um, no longer useful and a threat. Um, we also saw this occurring during the, the during World War II, where um, Japanese Americans were, were incarcerated and interned. Um, 80,000 80, um, of these Japanese Americans were U.S. citizens, and still their question, their loyalty to the U.S. was questioned. Um, and then we, we saw an increase in Islamophobia and attacks on Sikh Americans after 9-11. So there's this idea that, you know, we are always going to be suspected. Um, our loyalties will always be questioned. And that makes us a really convenient scapegoat um, when um, our country is experiencing some kind of threat, whether it's economic, um, whether it's a national security threat, um, or whether in this case it's a pandemic. So some of the more some of the more like interpersonal ways that this plays out is um, through microaggression. So many of us who are Asian American, many of us who are foreign born, it get this question a lot where you know we meet somebody, they ask us, where are you from? You tell them, in my case, I'm from Texas. And they say, no, no, I mean, where are you really from? Um, and this idea that, you know, I'm not interested in, in where you're from in the US. I, I want to know what country you're from um, because in my mind, you're actually not. You're not American, um, and it's really painful for folks who have been in this country for multiple generations. A lot of Japanese Americans um, have been in this country for you know three generations or more. Had family members who fought in all of the wars on the side of the U.S. and they're still kind of asked to um, to um, this question of where are you really from? And then as part of that, it's also this identity denial. Um, compliments you speak English so well, and this is. Um, some data that sort of shows us that it's not just occurring experientially. There's data to back this up. Um, this was a poll um, where they asked um, several hundred um, individuals, you know, have people ever asked you where you're from, assuming that you're not from the U.S.? 64% of Asian Americans um, reported that compared um, to, you know, 27% um, of Black Americans, 7% of White Americans. Okay, so this is another way that it shows up in personally. Um, and then um, there are some effects of this perpetual for, foreigner stereotype for us. It, it at a psychological level, what it does is it increases the sense of identity conflict. You know, you're constantly being told and sent messages that you're, you know, not really not a real American, um, which produces a lot of um, kind of questions about belonging, questions about. Um, you know, how how much am I part of this larger American project? Um, will I always be seen as foreign, no matter how much I'm committed to, to staying and investing in, in this country? So report, reports show that um, awareness of that stereotype as it plays out in our own lives is a significant predictor of identity conflicts, lower senses of belonging, lower hope, and life satisfaction for Asian Americans. Um, and it also affects um, our everyday behavior. So we've seen since the pandemic started um, lots of different ways that many of us have coped. One um, that has come up in some of these spaces I've been in is Asian Americans reporting that they are engaging in identity assertion techniques where they're trying to um, trying to project to others their Americanness through references to popular culture by engaging in quote unquote more American practices and, and really kind of moving away from some of their heritage practices um, that actually foster a sense of belonging and connection to culture. Okay, so it can kind of develop into this opposition oppositional kind of identity and and also, um, you know, a, a need to kind of um, enact what they understand to be Americanness. So when I'm in, I was in a conversation with one Japanese American man who described how at the peak of this. Um, Last summer, he 
compulsively started going out and buying clothing that had American flags on it. And he's like, I just felt like I needed to always be wearing an American flag on my body somehow to signal um, that he was American. Okay. And finally, a model minority stereotype um, is also part of our experience. It's also another way that racism um, is unique, sort of the way that racism manifests is unique to Asian Americans. Um, and the model minority stereotype is, is basically the stereotype that we are all high achieving, that we are all success stories. Um, and it's problematic, even though it's a positive stereotype, it's problematic because it minimizes the reality of anti-Asian racism. Um, we can think back to the Atlanta shootings, how quick the, the police chief was to, to minimize the racial component of that crime. Um, you know, the idea being that racism isn't something that happens to Asian Americans. And that's something that many Asian Americans um, prior to this moment also believed. So it, it also contributes to the invisibility of our experiences in US history. Um, it ignores the tremendous diversity, as I mentioned at the very beginning, the tremendous socioeconomic diversity and health disparities within our group um, that require intervention, that require pro specific programs um, and funding to support those initiatives. And it also creates a false distinction between good minorities and bad minorities um, and is used to oppress Black Americans um, while driving a wedge between Black and Asian communities, okay? Um, so it's problematic in, in those ways. Um, and, uh, you know, it also contributes to shame um, that Asian Americans experience if they feel like they're not living up to the moniker of model minority. Okay, if you're an Asian American who's struggling, um, mental health issues, um, difficulties in school, um, there is a lot of internalized shame around not meeting those, those community expectations, not meeting those expectations of the public. Okay. Oh, actually, I had some other slides that aren't showing up. So, um, um, I, I, you know, I think that the other the other important piece of this is that um, is that for many of our clients, this shows up in in stories about walking this kind of fine line um, between wanting to please their parents, many of whom are immigrants to this country who have sacrificed. There's a lot of pressure on them to be high achieving um, and a lot of desire to please their parents because of cultural values. Um, and then coming and feeling, you know, like the, it's difficult for them to get a lot of support in schools. It's difficult for them to get support in, in the workplace. And um, many of us are socialized to um, be compliant, to be conforming to not cause, um, to not elicit um, others' attention. And this, um, you know, this is this is a problem in terms of, you know, getting the help that we need. It's, it's a problem in terms of, of recognizing, especially when we have mental health issues that we do need, um, we do need formal supports, okay. Um, let's see here. And then in terms of its impact on us, racism related stress um, and impact, um, there, there, what I have been observing clinically um, is that a lot of our Asian American clients are revisiting moments in their history through a new lens. You know, many Asian Americans are reporting that this is kind of a new experience to see themselves as vulnerable to racism um, especially those who are fairly high achieving and prompting a kind of revisiting of history, revisiting of experiences in their past and wondering, did I miss something? Was that racism? Um, and questioning their own understanding of what it means to be Asian. This is coming up with a lot of my clients. Um, and we are seeing uh, increases in mental health um, symptoms. So a number of studies, including our own research, um, finds that um, that the more experiences of discrimination reported by our participants, the higher their levels of depression and their higher levels of anxiety and worry. They're also reporting cognitive symptoms, difficulties concentrating, um, avoiding um, going out into the streets, avoiding interacting with others. One person I spoke with, like, says when they walked down the street, they just don't make eye contact with anyone. So we're seeing these kind of um, experiences and, and um, engagements in mistrust and hypervigilance. 
behaviors. And this is true not just for people who've experienced discrimination, that sort of street level um, discrimination, but also racial microaggressions negatively predict mental health as well. So it's correlated with depression symptoms and negative affect. Um, so some of the ways that we are coping, we're coping a lot of different ways. Um, I mentioned some of these already. Um, we are engaging in self-care. We are um, speaking out. We are preparing and practicing um, um, behaviors that will allow us to feel more confident in intervening when we see discrimination occurring um, and, and levels of sort of trying to assert ourselves um, to disrupt the model minority stereotype to disrupt the stereotypes of Asians as paths of an easy targets. And then a really important way that we are coping is um, through activism. Okay. And this is a, a really important um, proactive coping strategy um, that is kind of connected to um, uh, Bri Brianna French and her team's um, radical healing framework. So I did have a slide. Fortunately, I think I put up the wrong version of this presentation, but um, the radical healing framework um, recognizes the importance of, of existing in the, in the dialectic of recognizing our racial trauma and suffering and systemic oppression um, while also fostering hope in collective liberation. And so this, this model of working with racial trauma um, is informed by um, Black psychology and liberation psychology, and it was developed by a, a diverse, multiculturally, multiracially diverse team of psychologists who were really struggling with, you know, how can we, um, how can we not just exist in a state of despair um, when we are a minoritized people? How can we kind of offer our clients and offer ourselves a path forward while not not ignoring the the suffering of our ancestors? Um, and not ignoring the pain of the moment, but also not kind of just staying there, trying to envision a path forward for us. And so that model includes, um, you know, allyship with other communities of color. It includes connecting with our ancestors and recognizing the resilience um, and the strength that they've exhibited. Um, it includes critical consciousness, so um, learning um, and developing a critical analysis of the problem um, and you know, engaging in, in acting in terms of sociopolitical um, uh, action um, and also fostering hope. So engaging in things that bring us joy, um, you know, in leaning on collective cultural wisdom and cultural heritage experiences that, that give you a sense of belonging, that give you a sense of connection to your heritage culture. Um, and then also, you know, as part of that, it means really knowing our history. And so there is a long history of Asian American resistance and activism. So back in the 1870s, um, railroad workers went on strike in 1879 to demand equal wages, um, as, even as white workers were paid double. Um, in the 1940s, um, we saw that Japanese Americans, Gordon um, Hirabashi, um, Hirabayashi, Fred Korematsu, Mitsui Endu took their cases to the U.S. Supreme Court to challenge the unconstitutionality of the internment camp. So there was active resistance to this. In the 1960s, we saw Filipino labor organizer Larry Inalong, who joined forces with Cesar Chavez to organize the, the Delano Grape Strike. It lasted a full year, and that resulted in improvements in working conditions for farm workers. And then in the 1980s, we saw um, that in response to the, the killing of Vincent Chin um, by two auto workers who mistook him for Japanese and blamed him for the declining auto industry, um, the, the lenient sentencing, they were given no jail time, galvanized the Asian American community, led to so many protests and resulted in the first federal, federal civil rights trial for an Asian American. So we're, we have across our history, yes, we have, have had trauma and we have had acts of resistance and activism. And so it's important for us to like connect to that history and know that this is part of who we are too. So what are some tips for Asian Americans who are struggling in this moment? So, you know, I'm working with these clients and often our conversations are about how can we 
um, not internalize what's happening to us? How can we, you know, reflect on um, our parents' experiences as immigrants, our experiences throughout our lives of being racialized as Asian American, um, problematizing the model minority stereotype. Um, so the client I mentioned that I work with, that I'm working with, um, you know, had an opportunity to take a leave of absence at work because uh, she was experiencing such high levels of anxiety and burnout um, that she was she was really you know at risk of wanting to leave the, her profession completely. Um, fortunately, somebody reached out to her, told her about some options available, including taking a medical leave, um, and she her first reaction was actually one of guilt and shame, um, feeling that she wasn't deserving of that kind of support, feeling embarrassed that she was struggling as much as as much as she was. And it's very connected to her inter internalization of the model minority idea. So we we've been doing some unpacking about that sense of unworthiness, the sense of um, embarrassment that she is experiencing difficulty. Um, and also, you know, validating her real fears and anxieties about being a target of discrimination in this moment. So we are talking somewhat sometimes um, in our work together um, about the history of Asian American racism, um, because I found that many of us don't know this history um, and really kind of internalize and blame ourselves when things like this occur. Um, understanding the impact of the model minority stereotype, perpetual foreigner stereotype, et cetera, um, how that shapes how we view ourselves um, and begin to resist that oppressive narrative and develop a more affirming counter narrative. Um, it's important to, to be sharing our stories of struggle and success. So I'm you know, encouraging my clients to like talk about these experiences, not just in therapy, but with their family members, with their children, with their colleagues and to ask for help when when they need it and sometimes they need a lot of support and scaffolding to to do that because it's it's not how they've typically coped with um, difficulty um and also practicing and speaking up and asking for what you want so that stereotype um that asian americans are you know hard workers but we're not leadership material that's an important stereotype um, to be challenging actively and then also calling attention to racial discrimination when it occurs and using your power to uplift others. So I'm seeing so many um, examples of Asian Americans who are feeling more, con more and more connected to their black members of their community, um, developing more empathy, um, understanding, wow, this, is, this might be a fraction of what my black friends and black colleagues um, experience when they talk about feeling targeted when they drive in their cars and when they go out on the streets. So feeling of some affinity and connection to other BIPOC, other communities of color, feeling solidarity and, and feeling more committed to collective liberation and engaging in um, social activism. Um, and then, you know, also tips on how we can be supportive. You know, we, we need to be deepening our own knowledge um, about these issues, which is why I'm so glad so many of you are here educating ourselves about the history of Asian Americans and the ongoing challenges that we face. Um, I've been recommending really highly the PBS documentary five part series on Asian Americans. I think it does a really great job of filling in um, the gaps um, in our educational system. Many of many of us have not you know, learned much about Asian American history in, in school. Um, so it's something you can watch with your kids. It's something you can watch as a family. Um, and to listen for, um, in our clients' narratives, listen for experiences of trauma. Um, I have been finding that there, my, many of my Asian clients are kind of um, tentative in, in talking about their experiences. They feel guilty. They feel like, well, you know, who are we to complain? Yes, it's bad right now, but you know, um, you know, there's so many ways in which we actually have privilege. And so there's kind of a little bit of a reticence to talk about these experiences um, 
um, wonder if they can actually, you know, take up space to, to talk about this. So to really try and encourage that if you if you're um, working with your clients um, and to invest in the well being of our clients, um, our friends, our colleagues. Um, this is a really, really stressful time for many of us. Um, and we're we're struggling to know how how best to respond. Um, and also, if you're, you know, in a position of management or supervision to really start to be curious about how some of these common stereotypes, the perpetual foreigner, yellow peril, model minority stereotype might be shaping your stereotypes um, uh, unintentionally in terms of what expectations you have about your clients, about your supervisees, about your colleagues. Um, one study found that Asian Americans uh, Asian American white collar professionals were the least likely ethnic group to be promoted into leadership positions. Um, and white professionals were more than twice as likely to be promoted. So the idea again being we're hardworking, we keep our heads down, we do what we're told, but we're not really leadership material. Is that idea shaping your, your projections about who has potential for leadership? And then finally to commit to becoming an ally. So um, you know, educate yourself um, through reading books, taking a bystander training, learning skills for interrupting discrimination and harassment when it occurs, and really start to broaden your scope of what racism might look like in the various communities that it affects, including Asian Americans. Okay, I'm going to pause here to take some questions, um, and we can just kind of open it up for discussion. Okay, great. Sorry. Thank you so much, Dr. Chang, for the presentation. Um, yeah. Really looking forward to the Q&A portion. Uh, so we had uh, some really good questions coming in. Um, just because you were just speaking about allyship, the first one is, are there spaces or opportunities for clinicians to become better allies or continue this type of work? Um, are there spaces for Asian Americans to become better allies? Yeah, essentially, I think it's really geared around conversations and um, kind of continuing the work. Yeah, so um, there, there have so obviously this has been a tragic year for a lot of us, right? So what we saw after George George Floyd was murdered last spring, we saw that um, within the Asian American community um, there was a, a lot of mobilization among, I would say, younger generations of Asian Americans to, um, to show allyship to the black community. There was a flurry of activity to sort of translate um, uh, informational guides to talk about Black Lives Matter in a bunch of different Asian languages, um, encouragement to really start to look at anti-black racism within the Asian American community. And that has, you know, fallen um, sort of the latest iteration of efforts among the Asian American community to to work in, in um, solidarity with black and brown communities um, across our history as well. So that's sort of the latest version of it. Um, and so there are lots of organizations that um, you can be involved in, um, Asians for Black Lives, there's lots of other ones um, where there, there's an effort to try to do that work of like looking at all you know what other messages have we internalized about other racial groups including black americans and and really starting to um, disrupt those narratives um, as well so i would say there are you know there are a number of organizations that are working to do that and we've had um some experiences within um sort of solidarity in this moment with african americans you know, being really public in support of Asian Americans as well. So just, just you know, as that context, um, the, the hostility between Asian and black communities, I would say, um, is, is largely um, uh, in some ways fed by, by media accounts, by, um, we, we know that, that there's a, that at least like in, in um, Los Angeles, for example, um, there was some conflict between Korean Americans and Black Americans, um, and that was that was you know 
the, the effects of sort of economic interdependence and also um, supported by white supremacy. So back to the idea of the model minority myth, model minority stereotype was created by a white sociologist um, who tried to up, who talked about Japanese Americans as being an example of how we can succeed. This is a country, this is a, a meritoc meritocratic country. And that if Japanese Americans can thrive even after their incarceration experiences during World War II, then African Americans should be able to thrive as well. So Asian Americans have been used as a wedge to push down black to oppress black Americans. Um, and the the sort of fake promise of that is that they will somehow become honorary whites, right? And we know that that is not true in the current moment. We are saying that that's not true. So part of what we need to be doing is to, to, to shine a light on those structural processes um, that perpetuate this idea that we are at odds with each other. Um, and so one thing that sometimes I get asked in these talks is, you know, what about all of the, the, um, the um, cell phone footage of black Americans who are assaulting Asian Americans? And I wanna be very, very clear that uh, the vast majority of assaults and hate crimes committed against Asian Americans are committed by white people. So if in your mind you're kind of thinking, oh, this violence is mostly occurring from black Americans to Asian Americans, that is actually completely not true. Okay, it's, it's a skewed um, amplification of available media, but that's completely not true. Um, the vast majority, more than 80% of these acts and assaults are coming from white Americans directed towards Asian Americans. And yet we we somehow don't think about that. You know, we think about Atlanta, the, the shooter was a white man. The shooter in Indianapolis was a white man. Um, and we don't think, we don't sort of act, we don't like encode that somehow. Um, but, you know, we see cell phone footage of a, a black American um, assaulting an Asian American, we think, oh, all black people hate Asian Americans, and that's just not true. Sorry, kind of got on my rant, um, but that's a, a real misconception that we need to be correcting. Um, no, that's perfect. Questions? Thank you. Um, yeah, definitely appreciate that. Uh, another question that came in was, uh, do you have any suggestions to support Asian and Asian American families returning to school in September. Yeah, there's a lot of concern about that for sure. I mean, one thing that I would recommend is that is that Asian families um, organize and have a conversation with the school directly. So the school needs to be sending messages. Um, that are counteracting these narratives that Asian Americans are to be blamed, Asian Americans are to be feared, um, and to set the tone um, for how you know that community should be, you know, working together to you know come out of come out of this like really difficult year. And so some of what they can be doing is um, is providing educational materials to teachers so that they can have conversations about this with their students. Um, that should be happening. I hope it's been happening in your in your schools. That there's been some acknowledgement of the scapegoating that's occurred over the past year, um, and so offering some, you know, some educational materials to the to the to the teachers, um, so that they can also uh, disrupt those behaviors when they see it occurring. So, it's I think it would be appropriate to you know contact the school, ask them what are you doing to keep um, you know, Asian American students in particular from being um, shunned, avoided, blamed, et cetera, um, and to ask for some, you know, a plan. And it could be co-created with families. Um, you know, you welcome to like, if you wanna reach out to me, I can send some resources that, um, that might be helpful. But I think it's totally appropriate, you know, as we enter the summer um, to begin to, to have those conversations with the schools. And the other piece is that um, we should be talking to our kids about this. I hope that you all have been talking to your children. Like there are, there's actually um, um, some great guides that um, I can also share out as well, um, like guides like kids books to understand and the anti-Asian hate that's occurring um, so that they're not kind of internalizing it. They're not blaming themselves. They're not um, feeling shame. 
So talking to our kids to give them a way to understand what's happening um, that is coming out of a place of fear and confusion um, can also help them be more prepared um, when and if this occurs, you know, they experience this at school. Great, thank you. And another question that came in was uh, from a clinical perspective, uh, given the current climate, should I ask directly ask my Asian and Asian American participants about their experiences of trauma related to recent events? I think so. Actually, I think you, I think you can, I think, you know, um, again, there might be some avoidance of bringing it into the, the room, depending upon your identities. Um, and I think putting it on the table would open up a door for them to talk about it if it's occurring. So I think you can frame it like, you know, I'm, I've been, you know, I've been reading about and I'm really aware of the increases in anti-Asian hate and in violence that's been occurring over the past year. Um, I think it's awful. And I, you know, I was curious as to whether, whether you've experienced something like this or how you're doing, how are you kind of feeling about all this that's happening? Because even if they haven't directly experienced it, the odds are very likely that they have, they know people who've experienced it or that they are um, worried about themselves, their parents, their children. I know a lot of Asian Americans that I know are really, really worried about their elderly parents um, and are trying to make arrangements so they don't have to go, you know, out walk around um, if they can avoid it. So it might not be that they've directly experienced any of these events, but that they're preoccupied with worry and anxiety about you know, for their loved ones, um, or they, it might be affecting their own behavior. So I, I think it would be really important to introduce it and to, and to just ask, and even if, um, it hasn't happened to them, I think they would probably experience it as, as really compassionate and supportive. Perfect. Thank you. And I, I think that I, really I, aligns with the next question. Oh, sorry, which was, uh, uh, about vicarious trauma, but I, I think, you know, you stating that it's just important to really talk through it and uh, bring it up anyway is important. Yeah, I mean, so with my clients, like they, they are talking about how um, it's been really hard to not, especially, you know, when, when the media were really covering it in March and April and May, you know, with Asian Pacific Heritage Month, there was a lot of coverage about this that my clients were talking about like compulsively scrolling on their phones at night, like just reading about the latest thing, the latest thing, the latest thing. Um, and they were, it was increasing their level of distress, even if they weren't experiencing it in the world, getting exposed to it through the onslaught of media, um, talking to their friends was actually increasing their, their stress level. So um, they, they, you know, like all of us, we have to regulate our media use. And so for some of them, they're realizing, you know, I need to kind of cut back on, you know, watching the news, uh, being on social media, it's, it's um, too dysregulating for them. So that all of this, it becomes part of the clinical work. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Dr. I just want to thank you for such a wonderful presentation. Uh, we are coming up at the top of the hour, but folks have really asked for any resources that you could share. So I, I'd love to circle back and hopefully send some of those out. Uh, but I do want to take this opportunity to thank you for a great presentation and thank all of you for joining us. Thank you so much. Um, appreciate you being here. Yeah. And yes, I will um, so share. Our... Sorry about that. Oh, no, I was just, I was reiterating that. Yes, I will share out some resources for folks um, related to some of the things that I've already discussed. Perfect. So everyone, we do have some upcoming events uh, on our CTAC website uh, that you can check out. The first is the conversations with Dr. Tony, reimagining youth suicide prevention, uh, which is on Monday, June 21st, as well as a social determinants of health uh, of mental health webinar on June 23rd. Um, 
And don't forget to check out our webinar next week on Education Matters, a series for FPAs and YPAs. Uh, these slides for this presentation will be available uh, within uh, three to four days, uh, so please check the CTAC website. Uh, and please don't forget to visit ctacny.org for any other offerings that we can uh, share with you. If you have any questions, please let us know. Um, and otherwise, thank you again for joining. We hope to see you next time. Bye, everyone.